So as many of you know, I do all these videos and a lot of the Jordan Peterson stuff. Nancy just mentioned Jordan Peterson in the news and about a certain anti-anxiety drug he was on and all of that. Um, lately, I've been doing a lot of videos about what's often called the meaning crisis. And it's this situation where we wonder about the relationship between being physical creatures and story, which in many ways is really what we are. And another Canadian psychologist who started making videos, he and another guy who wrote a book, I've speak, spoken with both of them a bit now, talk about how the fact that zombie stories have arisen in our culture partly because deep inside we think we're zombies. We, we, we imagine that the world is dead and we're the only living thing and increasingly we wonder how alive we are. If we're sort of like zombies walking through, stumbling through life, just doing mindless chores. Uh, we wonder how the question of story and physicality fit because in many ways, well, a bunch of you are older than I am even here. I remember my grandmother once, I was a college student and she lived right near the college and she was in her late 80s, early 90s and I visited her one day and she said to me, she said, you know, when I look in the mirror, I see this old woman looking back at me, but inside, I'm still that 20-year-old woman who got married. And, and, and that gets into the fact that in many ways, what we are, and we feel this as we age, is, is we are, in a sense, this autobiography, this story that runs. And it's a story our parents told about ourselves before we knew ourselves. And then usually by the age of three or four or five, we start having memories. And, and then we begin to connect all of the elements of our life into this one long story. And even as our body ages, this story doesn't age. Just like stories don't age. Just like you might read a story out of the book, but the book in some ways only points to the story. The story, you can burn the book or destroy the book and the story lives on still. And, and it's sort of that way between us and our bodies. And, and so we're, we're, a human being is sort of in some ways this, this living, vibrant story in a body that ages, and we don't quite know how mind and matter fit together. And so a pastor friend of mine on his blog had a bunch of these quotes. Lewis Carroll, no, no, the adventures first, explanations, explanations take such a dreadful time. Actually, the word explanation is about flattening. And what we've done to people is we've said, oh, you feel this and you think this and you do this because of these things over here. And then we wonder, am I a person? Do I choose? Do I have choice? Do I have will? Leo Tolstoy, all great literature is one of two stories. A man goes on a journey or a stranger comes to town. Sumon Kid, The Secret Life of Bees, stories have to be told or they die. And when they die, we can't remember who we are or why we're here. Roger Kipling, if history were taught in the form of stories, it would never be forgotten. And Philip Pullman, after nourishment, shelter, and companionship, stories are the things we need most in the world. Now the last one, I put an X, I would have put a box around it because I disagree with it. Because I actually think we need stories more. It doesn't mean we don't need food and drink and shelter, but the rising suicide rates in the United States are not because they're lacking food and drink and shelter. It's amazing how many people I've known in my life, whether they were poor Haitians living in very difficult situations or homeless people on the streets of Sacramento, we think, well, if I have all of these things, then I'll be happy. But I find people, and we find them on the news and in the, in the movies and in the magazines, who have absolutely everything that any of us would imagine, and they're not happy. And we think, well, well then how does life work? 
Isn't life getting what you want and then you're happy? No, it isn't. Now we've had three stories so far about Jesus and all these three stories, we've had a lot more than three stories, but all these three stories revolve around leadership in the world. Three weeks ago, we talked about Jesus and his, the secret of his success and how he sends out these hapless disciples to, with authority to cast out unclean spirits. And we talked about how that unclean spirit thing just reaches back into the Old Testament Mosaic law. And it's all about resolving the chaos in people's lives. And how many of you, if you thought about it long enough, wouldn't come to me and say, Pastor, if you have a magic wand, eliminate the chaos in my life. Because the chaos takes what form? This, this problem, this unresolved thing, this issue, this incident, this happening, this illness, this something that, that, that I can't deal with and it just keeps seeping chaos in my life and I want to get rid of it. So he sends out the disciples and they have the authority and bang! <gasps> and, and it's so remarkable that, that Jesus was already famous but now he's uber famous and even Herod hears about him. But Herod, Herod's plagued by his guilty conscience and where he should see Jesus, all he can see is John the Baptist that he killed. And we talked about that story. And now Jesus and his disciples regroup from their missionary journey, and they need a break. Now, most world leaders use Phil Pullman's definition that first what people care about is food and shelter and money and all of these things. Because that's how world leaders work. They work on your fears, well you better elect me or the other guy's gonna do all these bad things. Or they work on promises. If you elect me, the economy will be great and our enemies will be put down. This is the way leaders work. Is this how Jesus works? The apostles gathered around Jesus and told him all that they had done and taught. And he said to them, come away to a deserted place. Now again, right here, if you understand your Bible, the desert is the place that God brings Israel after he brings them out of slavery. And in that desert place, God feeds them with manna and God equips them to be his people. But they don't do so good in the school of the desert. Come away to a deserted place all by yourselves and rest for a while. For many were coming and going, and they had no leisure. Jesus was so famous, there's always everyone, someone wanted to talk to him. He needed to pray for this person. He needed to do that. Now his disciples all have this harriedness that Jesus had. And, and, and they're, they're just all tired. And I love the Greek word that they use here. They had no leisure, which you'll notice all the different translations struggle to translate it. The, the Greek word is eukairo. Now, kairos is the word for time, but there are two Greek words for time. One means chronos, which is kind of like chronograph, which is this time goes like this. And the other is kairos, which is moment. And you is the, is the positive. So a eulogy is a good logos or a good word. You kairos is good time. It's refreshing time. It's that moment where we say, <sighs> and they've had none of that for a while. So Jesus says, come with me to the de deserted place and we'll get away from all these people and we'll have a retreat together. And so they went away in the boat, because they're fishermen, to a deserted place by themselves. But now many saw them going and recognized them and they hurried there on foot with all, from all the towns and arrived ahead of them. It's like the paparazzi, you can't get away from them. As he went ashore, he saw a great crowd and he had compassion for them. He didn't, I don't know, you can go on YouTube and like search for Justin Bieber paparazzi or you remember Lady Di who died trying to escape from the crowd. Well, 
Jesus sees them, and you can just imagine he's sort of, oh, okay, all right. Yeah, compassion for them. Because they were like sheep without a shepherd. And he began to teach them many things. When it grew late, his disciples came to him and said, uh, read the room here. I know you're teaching and, you know, everything's, everybody's getting what they need, but there's some realities that are about to impinge upon us. This is a deserted place and the hour is now very late. Send them away. Now, it was really nice, Jesus, when you got off the boat. We all felt tired and, and you're really compassionate. We get all that, but now it's time to say, okay, people, time to go and go to the nearby towns and get some food and the towns will extend hospitality and show's over for tonight. So that they may go into the surrounding country and villages and buy something for themselves to eat. But he answered to them, you give them something to eat. The disciples probably stepped back. They said to him, are we to go and buy 200 denarii worth of bread? A denarii is what you might get for a day's labor. So 200 denarii is coming up on a year's wages. Are we, we to go and buy 200 denarii worth of bread and give it to them to eat? I mean, Lord, you, you asked for some crazy things, but really? After everything we've done, you expect this of us? And he said to them, how many loaves do you have? Go and see. So he gives them another command. All right, go look what you got. When they had found it, they said, Five loaves of bread, probably about this big. Two fish, probably about this big. It's what we got. We don't have 200 in air eye. We don't have time to go buy bread. We have five loaves and two fish. He ordered them. So he's a leader. He ordered them, and they listened. He ordered them to get all the people to sit down in groups. I am, this is quintessential gospel of Mark, all the little details, the green grass. And this echoes Psalm 23. He makes us to lie down in green pastures. So they sat down in groups of 50, a hundreds, and of fifties. And taking the five loaves and two fish, he looked up to heaven. Why? Well, you know why. and blessed, and broke. Now, if we were having communion, you'd all be watching me when I picked up that bread and broke. It's the same words here. He broke it, and they remembered it. And gave them to his disciples to set before the people. Just five loaves and two fish. And he divided the two fish among them all. And they all ate and were filled. And they took up 12 baskets full of broken pieces and of the fish. Those who had eaten the loaves numbered 5,000 men, which means there were likely maybe as many women plus children. Remember in the Dominican Republic when we'd say go do a baptism, it's like all kinds of people would, if a town was nearby, they'd all come out of the town because, well, there's this crazy white missionary, he's tall and he drives a truck and little people from that church and something's going to happen because I'll tell you, if you're living in a little town where there ain't much to do, anything that happens, you want to go see. So they all come out and watch. And he feeds them. Now, now, before I ask the question about story and the physicality of life, I've, I've been listening to a podcast called Hardcore History, and he did about six episodes, about four or five hours each, on the First World War. What a, what a hard thing to listen to. The terror, the horror, the sacrifice, the bravery in some moments, and the and the despair in others. You'll hear one story of two buddies in a trench, 
and, and, and someone had gone over the top and it was in no man's land and he's wounded and he's crying out. And, and a guy will get up and everybody knows it's suicide, but he'll run out there and he'll rescue his body. And we hear that, it's like, wow. And then another story where a guy's in the trenches and there's a basically a kid because as the war dragged on, they just, you know, we're going to take the 18-year-olds, we're going to take the 17-year-olds, we're going to take the 16-year-olds. So he's in a trench and there's a kid with him. And he's looking at the kid and he's thinking, oh man, oh man, a kid shouldn't be out here. And then the bombs slide and the gas starts and shrapnel pierces his kit. And he, and he realizes that his gas mask is ruptured and he looks over at the kid and the kid already has his gas mask on and there's a look of terror in his eyes and the fear of death grabs him and he grabs the kid and he takes the mask off and he puts it on himself and he watches the kid die. And he survives the war and every night when he went to sleep he thought about what he did. That's what this world is like. Is it really true that oh, I survived the war, I have food on my table, I have a shelter over my head, Shh, too bad for that kid? No, stories matter more, but stories and matter matter together. Jesus says to them, you give them something to eat, and the disciples are like, we can't do that. We, we, we don't have enough money. We don't have the stuff. And Jesus says, I want to share my mission with you. I want to share my story with you. I want my story to be your story. Jesus doesn't say, well, you know, fasting. We usually run out to the desert and we fast and we pray. And Jesus did. And Jesus did with his disciples. He doesn't say, okay, all you 5,000 people, we're all going to fast tonight. I didn't do that either. He says to the disciples, you feed them. And the disciples say, we can't. We're too poor. We're too small. We have too little faith. We can't do it. And Jesus is like, really? You really think you can't? You really think you can't do it when I'm with you? Remember the boat? Remember? Remember what kind of story you're really living in. You see, Jesus is a ruler unlike every other ruler. Most rulers live, the matter verse comes first, which is, let's give the people money. Let's give the people promises. Let's make them afraid. We'll rule by the sword. There's carrots and sticks. We reward friends with riches, and we punish enemies with contempt. That's how the rulers of this world work. Others are mind-verse rulers. Those are harder for us to recognize. There's a really interesting book called The Age of Addiction that talks about the fact that if you look basically over the history of the world, all these amusements and escapes basically dominate us. America was founded partly because tobacco was the coolest drug you could imagine in the 16th and 17th century. And then there was heroin. <laughs> and alcohol had been with us far longer than that. And then, and then heroin, and then cocaine, and, and then television, and then all of these things that we can escape because oh, our bodies are breaking down. Just, just, just put me in front of the TV and let me watch what I want and I can, I can forget my pains. So the rulers of the matter and the rulers of the mind, but they're always depart, they're always separate because nobody can rule them both. And then Jesus comes and mind and matter both come together. See, the, the miracle isn't a trick to win favor with the crowd. We know that. Read John 6. When the crowd keeps coming, like, hey, we found, we found a bread machine. And then Jesus says, you only follow me for the bread. They're like, yes, yeah, so? No. Unless you eat my body and drink my blood, you can have no part of me. And John 6 says that lots of people left. The miracle was meaning, has meaning. Because it pulls past and present and future together. It's 
it's manna and Moses in the desert where Moses gives them the law and God feeds them with manna. And so everyone outside along the Sea of Galilee is like, it's like we're back with our ancient forebears in the desert. It's the benevolence of the Father. He looks up to his Father in heaven. That's how the whole thing starts, right? And then the bread is multiplied. And it's the future. It's the abundance of the age to come. And it all comes into that moment. And everyone's just kind of like, what happened? What happened? It was a Cairo. Now, we know the stakes are real in this world. You don't need a war story to tell you that. You just look at your own life. And, and you have problems. Now, y'all don't know each other's problems, and I don't know all of them, but I know some of them. I got problems of my own. Jesus says, in this world, you will have trouble. And he didn't mean, well, maybe if you're evil, no. Or maybe if you're really good, no. In this world, you will have trouble. It will find you. And if you live long enough, it'll find you in the form of old age even, age of decay. We see that we are killing ourselves and this world one day at a time, and we don't know how to stop. Winston Churchill notes a time in 1915 when the British and the French and the Germans had all lost so many lives. They could see already the war was futile and pointless, but nobody could stop because for the politicians to say, we're just going to stop the war now, everyone who had lost people would say, hey, wait a minute. My son died for the reasons you started this war. Are those reasons no longer good? Why are we fighting this war anyway? Because as anybody can tell you in Vietnam or Afghanistan, it's one thing to start a war, it's another thing to get out of it. Why didn't Jesus just do some miracle and fix us? There's a question I think about and get all the time. People imagine that miracles convince us, they change our mind. Read the Gospels. The disciples are there when he stills the sea. The disciples are there when he raises the dead. The disciples are there, and in fact, he multiplies loaves and fishes right in their hands, and they still can't explain it. But when Jesus is in the garden and going to be arrested, they first pull out the sword, and then they flee. Miracles don't convince us. Because in the moment, we're all wow. But 50 seconds later, psh, we're faithless. See, Jesus first exposed the rulers of the matter first verse with his death. In the garden, when Peter pulls the sword, Jesus says, if anybody's going to be shed, if any blood is going to be shed here, no, I won't let you harm the servant of the high priest. I will heal his ear in front of all of you, and you take me and you kill me. Tell me what leader leads like that. Did Napoleon say to France, not one of your sons will die before me. Oh no, all of them die before Napoleon, or before Churchill, or before the Kaiser, or before any of the leaders. In fact, in that World War I podcast, it was noted that World War I was kind of the last war that we saw the children of generals die. Usually if the child of a general or a senator, yeah, you'll serve in the army just over there where nobody really gets hurt. Jesus confuses the rulers of the mind first verse with his resurrection. This isn't a dualism where, oh, why do people kill themselves? I just want the suffering to end, and if, and, if, and if I'm nothing but my body, then if I kill myself, the suffering ends. And Kierkegaard asks, what if you wake up to realize you're not just your body? And jumping off that bridge or taking that handgun doesn't stop the story. Oh, now imagine the horror. This isn't escape into heaven. Jesus rises from the dead, 
with the scars of his execution. This is the renovation and the reunion of heaven and earth, of mind and of matter, of our dreams and our physical reality. This is what Jesus is doing. And we're all just kind of watching, thinking, hoping, wondering. So how should you then live? Does the matter verse matter? Oh yeah. We start going without food because we don't have food or we don't have shelter or, or, or we're physically threatened. Yeah, we get, we get bothered fast and we get desperate and we do desperate things. The matter verse matters. Does the mind verse matter? Yeah. Someone, you have a fight with someone. Or someone says something to you that, that hurts your image of yourself or your reputation with others. Yeah, that matters too. Can anyone heal them both? How should you live? You have to live in both. Can you trust anyone with both? The question really is, what story do you live in? Do you live in a story where Jesus is king? You may say, yeah, but Christians, lots of people say they live in that story. Yeah, and they do. You say, well, live in the story that Jesus is king. It didn't seem to work for him. Did you see what they did to him on a cross? Yeah. Do you believe what he did on Easter Sunday morning? Well, I don't know. Well, then you're living in the story of I don't know. Maybe you should ask him for faith. Maybe you should ask him to move the things in your world. Maybe you should ask him to move the things in your heart. Let's pray. Lord, we don't know much. We're not any, we're not any better than your disciples. And it isn't until your spirit comes upon them that, they, that things start to fit together. But even after that, they have squabbles and Peter refuses to eat with a certain group of people and Paul will get depressed and, and they all get killed. But Lord, none of us get out of this world alive. So then we have to ask, whose story do we want to live in? So, Lord, we're here in this building, in this church, listening to this sermon, praying this prayer, hoping that you can hear us. And, Lord, we've all got our lists for you. Help us to believe, Lord, that whether or not our lists are any good, that, in fact, you are good, and you can do good things, and that we can trust in you, and that our trust is not misplaced. So hear our prayer. In the name of Jesus, amen. Would you stand?